So we will listen to Peter Levendal, who is uh, very knowledgeable about uh, coding and the reimbursement system in the US. And you will have uh, some 30 minutes or so. And then there will be time for some questions and answers uh, towards the end. So, yeah, Peter, just please, I will leave the word to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and of course, uh, covering the complete reimbursement system in, in US for, for like 30 minutes <laughs> would be like impossible. Uh, but I will do the best to actually at least uh, give you a, a basic view and, and some insights. And, and uh, in reality, I'm not a reimbursement consultant and, and uh, I'm mainly working coordinator affairs. Uh, but clearly, it's it's a very important component when you do develop product or in, if you want to go into the US market. And clearly what uh, have been seen uh, very, very often nowadays is that lots of companies try to go to US as the first market due to the new regulation in Europe. Because you clearly see that there are, if you have, especially if you have a new product, if there are if everything is in place in US regarding reimbursement and other things, it, it's easier to go out to the market, uh, depending on, on the 510k or, or PMA situation for the product. Uh, so, so I clearly see that there are lots of, of companies looking that way, but it's not as a normal state, it's not just to go there by flight and put in your shoes and everything sales goes straight forward. It, it's lots of thinking around it. Uh, so I will cover some of these things. Uh, the presentation, of course, is a very simplified view of things. It, it's uh, much more complex and details in certain areas, but there are a few takebacks, which is uh, some companies, of course, can, can remember. Uh, and, and it's also a way to start start the thoughts in, in the listeners here. Uh, as you remember, perhaps in, in the invitation, it's, it's uh, to give some better understanding. Uh, but also a little bit on, on how the reimbursement code and experts and the hospitals, etc., are thinking in this area. Because clearly it, it's a, a key thing, even though it's not the end if you can't get reimbursed, but, but it's uh, things you need to look into uh, to be successful in the marketplace. Uh, there are, of course, lots of definitions you, you need to learn if you want to be the expert in this area, but clearly reimbursement. Uh, and, and that's basically how, how you get the compensating provider for the cost of a treatment. Here, here it's more, of course, similar way in most part of the world. Uh, the two big programs in US is the Medicare, and these are governmental uh, covered, and that cover 65 plus uh, age, uh, and also disabled people. So, so that's basically what, what Medicare is about. Uh, some, some people, believes Medicare covers everything, but it's only 65 plus uh, and, and disabled people. And, and then it's a new, fairly new program. Uh, the Medicaid program is, is a more governmental state program, uh, which limits, uh, uh, which offers the, the one with limits income and, and uh, resources to cover their own cost. And, and this clearly is something to uh, remember that our state state programs and I will come back later on who the other players are. Uh, so how does it work then? It, it's uh, This is one picture out of three uh, and I will not go into depth to this but, but clearly as you can see there are lots of, of dependencies and lots of different acronyms etc and, and, and there are just to show that there are quite complex world uh, and it's there are also connection to, to, uh, to uh, the global World Health Organization on how we classify things, uh, but but that's are used on a high level and then lower down, of course, it's you as a part of it, and, and that's basically what I will uh, cover today. But is this is just to give a flavor that it's not like straightforward lines. There are a mix of things and it's lots of dependencies. Uh, in the healthcare system and reimbursement systems, there are in in US uh, there are three clear roads uh, and the first one is the patient of course a patient must uh, uh, to be able to, be, to get any kind of, of uh, uh, healthcare basically you need to enroll to health plan a health plan is more like uh, yeah you sign up for, for for 
for, for a system we could say which will give you some kind of, of uh, uh, healthcare. You can also, of course, be outside, but then you need to pay everything yourself and, and catch everything yourself. Then you have the payers. The payers is the one actually which pays out the money for, for to the hospitals, and the hospitals is the providers typical. But it can also be physicians, retailers, etc. The providers is typical the one with which are your customers, the one you try to sell the devices or, or softwares, uh, IVDs for. Uh, these are the ones using it, but the payers are, are paying for, for the services and, and uh, the use of the device as such. And uh, in the payers section, you have also three different roles, you could say, or three different providers. Uh, one is private payers, uh, the commercial and governmental. Uh, so I will go through a little bit later on, on what these three different areas are doing and, and who they are. Uh, Another key thing, of course, to realize that the reimbursement systems are based on, on a different type of codings. And coding is more like uh, you get the code to be able to easier describe a certain procedure or a certain uh, service. And so, so when you actually do the, the calculations and get the payment, it, it, you put in figures rather than lots of text. And, and this is typically used across the world in, in different shapes and formats. Uh, th there are the appointment of single devices, they typically use the healthcare common procedure coding system, and, and that's more uh, more on the device side. Uh, meanwhile, the, the CPT codes, the current procedure terminology, uh, is more on the procedure, on, on more, which means that the CPT code typically can include several devices, several uh, healthcare common procedure coding coded devices, so to say. But there are, of course, exceptions of all these rules. It's more like the general thing. Uh, and when you apply for a code in US uh, or, or try to get the code, it's typical the healthcare common procedure coding system you get into. Uh, but there are lots of acronyms in, in this, and there's uh, several hundreds. So I just get through a few of them. Uh, and the HOP system, it, it's basically the payment system, how do you get paid uh, from, a, from a provider perspective? And, and then you actually see how, how much payment there are in the HOP system, or do also have another system called OPS system. And, and there are similar, but there are lots of these different payment systems. Uh, and HOPS and OPS is mainly used by Medicare uh, activities. Uh, and then you have also another important part, we will also come back later on, is the APC, Ambulatory Payment Classification. And the APC code is used for, for more uh, supportive services, meaning it's not the direct uh, patient treatment or patient diagnostic. It is actually for the surrounding things. It could be set up a device. It could be a certain way of enroll a patient in, into the real treatment or, or, or diagnosis setting. Uh, to go in a little quick on, on uh, type of payers, and there are lots of, of uh, providers or payers, you could say. Uh, in, in the payer section, there are more than 900 providers, meaning that there are not more than 900 payers organization which could pay out money to the providers. And, and that there are, in general, there are four types of, of uh, payers. Uh, HMO, Health Maintenance Organizations, is typical in the insurance companies, uh, and they do uh, typically have service for a fixed price, meaning that they have a certain disease to pay a certain amount of money for, for that. Uh, you have a preferred provider organization, that's typical uh, organization which actually outsourced activities to handle the, the all, all the payment activities, but the in-source uh, uh, pro the providers which do the healthcare activities. So in the HMO, basically, they, they try to have all of the of the uh, activities in-house. The preferred providers try to have it outside as much as possible. And then perhaps the most common one is the point of service, which is a mix of HMO and PPO, meaning that they are trying to have a lot of activities in-house, but they also out-service uh, certain activities. This is quite important when I start to talk about who should you approach, 
Uh, because clearly there, there are, if you go on, on the Medicare and get the code there, it's quite simple, then you can always use that. But if you don't have a Medicare code or, or, or a CTP code, etc., then you can also go to the private payers and, and uh, go and ask them to bring in your product. Because clearly it's, uh, if it's insurance company pays for, for treatment, they also can, can add other devices, which helps them to, to get better service. So it's not uh, just black and white with the coding. Uh, the coding helps to, to charge the money, uh, but it can always, uh, there are other ways also, but more difficult ways. If you look on the example of payers uh, in, in private, which are private organizations, uh, you typically have lots of different Blue Cross, Blue Shields organization, and, and they typically have a, a name of, of, of the organization in, in front of that. And that could be in the state or it could be a city name, which are private but different, have the same name almost. You have uh, the insurance companies uh, like United Health, Humana, Kaiser Permanente, which are the more famous one. They are quite often also uh, based on, on different, difficult, uh, different geographical locations, like Kaiser Permanente is, is primarily in, in California, for instance, but, but there are in certain areas. And then you have, of course, the two, uh, the, the three big governmental program, Medicare, Medicaid, and, and SIP. SIP is more to cover uh, kids, uh, children. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the balance of this is that the governmental care is, is basically or payment it is 35% of the market. Meanwhile, the private insurance companies is, is the rest. So it's, uh, you could say that the Medicare uh, codes uh, and, and the governmental CMS codes in, in, in reality covers 35% of the market. The rest is covered by, by private companies. But uh, most of the private in, and the insurance companies are using the same coding to make life easier. And the reason, of course, is if you are, uh, if you are uh, an elder person going to one of the private private of the insurance company, these companies, of course, will claim money from the governmental part. So, so it's for them, it's easy to use the same codes across the line. So what uh, are the key steps in the reimbursement area then? Uh, identifying the medical device procedure uh, of serving using the coding, uh, HPS coding, for instance. And, and that's, of course, when you have a procedure, when you set up a new procedure in a hospital, for instance, they make sure that they the have the codes for the included devices and, and make sure that they know what device was including. And, and then uh, after that, of course, you need to make sure that the, that the coverage, uh, that the service and the device is paid for. Does the code actually cover that particular service or, or devices that was used? And, and that and that's a match. They, they actually go to the payment and, and then, of course, they go to the payers and claim the money. We have done the following procedure that included the, the following services or, or devices. And according to that code, this is uh, the claim we can do. And therefore, they get to pay it out from, from that area. And that's in reality how it works in most countries, even though using different wording. Uh, so the connection, why I'm typically involved more, more and more in these kind of activities. Uh, when I started my career many years back, it's, uh, I mean, regulatory was very, very uh, disconnected from these kind of activities. And, and in many companies still is. And, and, and today it's more like R&D, regulatory, business developers, and, and also how, how to secure the complete market access needs to be more aligned versus how it's been in the use. And, and this is, of course, in, in the pharma industry, this has been the case for many years because it's more even more important there in the past. But this is becoming a more important task for most companies. And, and right now, there are lots of companies that are not that good in this. And, and uh, normally you call it a, like the market access organization where you have all the different parts in, in the company involved. So, so my part in the in the past have been more to ensure the FDA clearance approval or listing, uh, ensuring that the indicators for use are aligned with, with the marketing and sales. 
Uh, and this is very important because clearly if, if uh, your device uh, have a different indication for use that doesn't fit the reimbursement code later on, then the hospital can't claim reimbursement. And if they can't claim reimbursement on, on that device, of course, the, the sales process will be very difficult because if the comp competing uh, devices have uh, the right wording in, in the indicate for use, intended use, of course, then they can sell the products much easier than you can do. The difference here in US is indicate for use is what, what the product is indicated for. Could be more like cancer care or something like, or cancer or, or uh, things like that. Intended use is more on the procedure side. So, so typical in, indicate for use is more for the product code. The intended use can typically be used more for the CTP code. Uh, so, so, so there are ways to do that. But the main thing here is that if there are mismatches, how you sell the product and what the claim uh, to the camp, uh, hospitals, you can get into trouble. And, and the reason is that uh, if the hospitals or the providers start to use your device and claim money for a certain code, which you don't have the approval for, in worst case, your company can be, be forced to pay some of the of, of this uh, reimbursement back to the government basically and that happens uh, especially on the on the uh, pharma side there are billion of us dollar every year which are claimed back by the government towards these companies uh, there have been uh, more of this also in uh, uh, in the device area even though it's much lower scale right now uh, but, but that will for sure increase. And for you, the one which uh, wants to check this further on, on how it looks like in, in the enforcement area, it, if you can go into the Department of Justice web page uh, in US and, and uh, just check into different enforcement actions that are done. And typical, there are like three or four thousand enforcement action towards the providers where they have claimed money for, for devices or services that have not really the possibility to do. So challenges. Uh, there are of course lots of challenges in, in this area, uh, especially if, if you have a new device. Uh, a new device uh, typical do not have an established code. Uh, or if there are existing codes, but but if, if you say that your new device is so much sup superior from an outcome perspective, but there are all the code for that kind of device, uh, then it might be difficult perhaps to, to sell the product because if you get the same amount of, of uh, reimbursement, but your device might cost so much more, that will hurt you in the sales area. Even, even though of course there are lots of the doctors of course want to have the best product which gives the best outcome. Uh, but that's in, in the end of the day, it's more like uh, if, if uh, your device is too expensive and, and if you can't show that you are so much better, that will be difficult in the sales process. Uh, and I talked about the coding, uh, the, the Department of Justice, they do not come to you directly, but what they do, of course, is uh, if you claim some, something on, on the in the user's manuals, in, in the sales brochure or, or the internet on, on the, your web pages, Department of Justice through FDA typical can claim claim, of course, that you're unlawful marketing. And, and the, the typical the unlawful marketing itself, you get a letter and then you remove the claims, then you think you're done. But what could happen is that you get sued by, by the providers. And, and that's happened some companies. I remember when I worked for GE Healthcare uh, back in 2008, they actually got into this trouble with, with FDA, uh, with, with the marketing labeling activities. And uh, I think they got like got sued by 4,000 providers in the US. So they're just handling all the, all the claims and on all the uh, legal action cost a fortune for them. But typical, they typical go for bigger companies, of course, because they know that the smaller companies do not have the funds for it. Uh, if, if you need a new code, it takes time and that can cost a lot of money. And I will soon uh, later here, will I will come back to a little bit on different ways you can do that and the risk with that. 
So basically, you could say the simplified five steps to the market. This is more, I think, you, I mean, that should always be on, on the list. And, and very seldom, if, if I look into the development procedures in, in companies, uh, they typically have the market feasibility, pro product idea, of course, the regulatory feasibility, et cetera, and the product development part covered. But if, it's very seldom I see the reimbursement feasibility for the markets you aim to go to. One of the reasons, of course, is that lots of companies do the same type of product over and over again, but a little bit better every time. Then, of course, you have typical reimbursement in place. But if you do new devices or, or, or a startup, you typically do not have know how the market works. You don't have the sales channels and, and the sales already set up. Uh, but I would say in nine out of 10 uh, development procedures or, or how to get the market access procedures, the reimbursement is missing. And, and this is so much more important nowadays than it used to be. It will be more and more about uh, the evidence in this area. Uh, and, and when you come to the point five, the market access activities, if you haven't thought about the reimbursement, if you're lucky, there are all of the codes there, which uh, fits your needs. But if you're unlucky, you need to do lots of extra studies and, and activities to actually ensure that they fit the reimbursement code or can try to get a new one. So that's uh, quite difficult. Afterwards, cost lots of money. So if you talk about the coding experts then, uh, typical, of course, these people sit uh, with, with uh, providers the one which, which are supposed to code and, and claim the money from, from the uh, payers. Uh, and these are very important people for the hospital chains or hospitals and, and uh, because they, of course, they are the one securing the income. Uh, they know the codes, of course, and how to handle that. And they know the regulation most of the time. Uh, and uh, in, in the past, quite often, I, I participate in a cell therapy conference for, from a regulator's perspective, and, and happens to be that uh, they have a similar conference uh, next door always, which was a huge conference for, for these coding experts. So they have annual meetings for these people, and there are typical 10,000 people attending these kind of conferences where they discuss how to utilize the codes in a better way. Uh, and you can then they start to realize when they have two days conference about uh, uh, or about how to make the codes correctly. And, and these guys are the ones which work with it every day. So, so they're not just to put up the codes, there are lots of things around it. Uh, these people, of course, is the key people to talk with, try to find them if possible, but it's very difficult. Uh, I remember when I was working for Lecta, we actually tried to talk with these people, the only way was actually, I talked with most of them because I went, went to the exhibition and, and had the coffee break mixed with them. That was the only way to talk with them, typical, because they're so uh, busy, typical, but it's also very, very important source within the hospitals. They don't really want to share it. And especially if, if there are, depending on how they use the coding system, of course, and how they claim it, it's, it's a comp competitive advantages to do it in the right way and how you handle it. And, there, and one other reason is that you can actually for patients when you do certain care, you can also claim money from different areas for the same patient, which means that you can claim from the Medicare system, but you can also claim from the insurance companies for instance, at the same time. So, so there are certain ways to earn more money uh, in, in, in a legal way, but, but more complex way. When they work with the coding, typical what they do when they set up a new procedure or, or start a new type of, of treatment in the hospital, they need to look into how, how the procedure looks like, what, what devices they have included and start to, to put up the process themselves. Because otherwise, of course, every patient otherwise would need to be coded separately. So they do this and, and what they do then is go through the different codes uh, that are included in a new procedure, for instance. And then, uh, of course, they have to ensure that that, that specific device fits that procedure. And, and therefore, they have to go through the different uh, uh, 
descriptions of that particular product. And quite often there are quite uh, detailed from a technical perspective. So they quite often needs to discuss with, with, uh, with the one which actually perform the, uh, the treatment, etc., to discuss what this particular product is. But this also means since it's very detailed from a technical standpoint, lots of these uh, needs to be looked into what you have in your indication for use or intended use when you approve the product. So, so if you have, for instance, uh, if it's look on some of the codes here, if you have uh, ultrasonic guidance for placement of radiation therapy fields, that needs to be reflected in the intended use or indicate for use that your device is intended for ultrasonic guidance for placement or relation therapy fields, for instance. If it's not in there if, and if it's not easy to say it's the same, then they can't use that code and they don't get paid. So, so this is partly driving some, some of the changes of the product, but also in ensuring that uh, the right product gets, gets paid for. So, so if, for instance, if you have instead, uh, if you have uh, X-ray guidance, then you could use the next code. But if you come up with something new, more like uh, uh, more like an algorithm to, to to do the same, software algorithm to do the same, then you don't get paid of these codes. Then you need to find another code. So, so this is the key and a key connection to intended use. And, and I remember also from, from uh, my old days when uh, robotic was included in in one of the codes every manufacturer need to add it robotic into the uh, to the intended use or, or indicate for use to ensure that uh, they still could get reimbursed for that code as always it's it's more theoretical so i will give a few examples on how, or actually one example how it works uh, and, and this is of course uh, linear accelerator it's a huge product uh, and, and the reason why taking this i will come into in a very few minutes the indicator for use is quite simple radiation anywhere in the body which means you can use it anywhere in the body uh, for 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 it the standard treatment is five days uh, a week for for six weeks you go to the hospital and do this in europe they they treat uh, uh, a page four patient per hour in US is typical two patient per hour. Uh, so, so it's much more busy in, in uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, you do it 30 times. But, but there are lots of new new devices coming out in this area. But the thing here is that you have a 510k route. There are lots of 510ks around. It's very simple to get the clearance basically. And as long as you keep to what other other vendors have done. Otherwise, of course, you need to add things and make sure that, that new things comes in here. The reason why I take this example, of course, I've been working with it, so I know, know the reimbursement system, the regulatory path around it. But the good example here is that the new technology procedures have been driving the reimbursement. So in this area, there are lots of high reimbursement. And the reason is that the new technology actually have, have forced or, or actually an, ensured better outcome. When I started to work in Olecta in 1998, 80% of the patients that received uh, radiation uh, died within five years. And today is 20% uh, of the people which got radiation dies in five days. Then you could say it's not only the devices, it's also a mix of, of different uh, technologies used with, with uh, combined with, with uh, chemotherapy, etc. But you can clearly see there are big connection between better devices compared with, with, with uh, the outcome. But there are also other things which are important here, and that's uh, the user organizations. And in this case, it's Astro uh, drives reimbursement. They are very active in, in this to drive, try to ensure that the reimbursement goes up and, and are kept. Because it's one thing to get the reimbursement, another thing also to keep the levels up. That's another issues to look into. Uh, and and uh, the good thing here is that when you have more like the competing area is more on the technology evidence versus the clinical. The clinical part, the asterisk is a doctor's basically, and they drive the clinical parts and they drive the clinical outcome that can be used for, for getting higher reimbursement. So it's more based on reality versus uh, 
studies which are done in a small population. But it also shows how complex the coding area can be and how it drives to provide to buy new technology. So I will give a few examples here. Uh, so you could say the reimbursement coding, new codes is released due to new technology driving outcome. But that also means that the, the providers uh, in this area need to buy new products. And, and the, the, therefore the, the new uh, the manufacturers need to come out with new product that meets the reimbursement codes, because otherwise they will not be able to sell. So, so, so it's more like a spinning wheel here. If a manufacturer get a new device that you get more reimbursement, other manufacturers needs to follow that. And as long as, as uh, the patient outcome is, is uh, getting better, that's a good good way. Then of course it could be in, in the in the long term, it might be that then the reaction reached the, the, the stage where the product itself will not actually get so much better. And still drive the reimbursement. So if you look into the different type of codes, and this is just to, to show what, what the coding expert sits with. So here you have uh, on the right side, you have different gradation codes, and that means the, the actual treatment of the patient. Meanwhile, on the left side, you have the associated codes, which, which are more the, more the uh, APC codes, procedural codes. Uh, and then, of course, you also have more the general codes. And as you can see, there are quite big difference between how much money you get for certain procedures. So if you have like a, a 2D 10 fraction treatment, you get $3,800. Meanwhile, if you do an EMRT simple 44 fractions, you get $26,000. And, and the difference between this uh, from a treatment perspective and an outcome perspective is quite big, to be honest. But it depends a little bit where, where in the body you are. Meanwhile, then you have associated codes, uh, which means that to be able to do the treatment right, you get payment. And if you look on, on, uh, on the column called 2016 APC on the left side there, you could see that you have the same APC code for, for four of these products, which means that you can claim all these four devices for that APC code. And, and for, for each of the device, if you use the device in, in the procedure, you get $166.65 per device. And you can use them in the same procedure. And that means that when it comes to the coding, you can actually have uh, the device connected to the, to the procedure of four devices, which means that you get 166.5 times four because of those four devices. But you also had the, the code itself, the, the APC, the procedural code itself gives, uh, the 5612 gives uh, then uh, $347. So you can add the procedure, $347, and then you get for each device included, $166. And, and then you have the treatment device, in this case, uh, EMRT, that gives $26,000. And then they have this follow up CT to make sure that the, between the treatments, so every, every time, and they do like 30 fractions to get $86 to do that. Uh, to be able to do the planning, uh, and every time they do a treatment planning for it, which typically is done the first time they go into the hospital uh, for the treatment, but it's typically followed up sometimes and changed. Then they get $345 for every time they do the treatment planning. And then before every and every uh, treatment, they do simulation of the treatment to ensure that they have positioned the patient right. You get it also $186 per time, and that's 30 times for a normal fraction. So, so this is the way how the coders look into it. They actually put make sure the code covering the activity, and then they can claim the money. So, so simple, simplified, you could say that you have a piece of paper, you put in all the different steps, all the devices, and, and then you look into what codes are covering this, what kind of, kind of money can I claim for this particular device or procedure and procedure and devices. Uh, of course, nowadays this is made in, in computers, but, but it's, uh, that's the way how it works. And normally in the processes they have in the hospital, these are presets processes 
the following. And, th and that's the reason why they quite often get into trouble because they have a preset and suddenly the doctor decides to skip the treatment simulation, but they probably have claimed the treatment simulation because that's the standard method. And then when, when uh, Department of Justice do know that they realize that you haven't done the treatment here, treatment simulation, therefore you have claimed $186 unlawful. So, so that's more how you get into trouble. But that's on the coding side and, and the coders of course need to know the processes and, and devices used in the hospital. So basically when you come to, to a new, new customer and try to provide your specific device, unless it's it's the same as they used to have but of another vendor, they need to let, check in to the hospital that this actually fits the purpose, it fits, fits the codes and, and it's in, included in the code because otherwise they can't really claim the money for it. So, so if you replace the comp competitors with one intended use or indicate for use with your product, which have a different indicate for use, even though it's the same type of product, then the hospital can get in trouble basically. So if you have a new device then, uh, there are lots of things you can do here. Uh, and and uh, you could change add indications so it fits another one, change technology. Uh, it might be that uh, you will not need a code, direct code, but you might uh, reduce the cost for the provider. That's also a way because you have cost and income. If you can reduce cost and time, they, they do not get additional income, but they can reduce their own cost, which, which means it will more, be more profitable anyway. So that's one way. Uh, you can also try, if, if you don't really want to apply for a new code, you can get the so-called PLC code from AMA. And, and that's just to have a code to, to put your service into. And, and the reason for doing this is that uh, in their different coding systems, because they're, everything they do in the hospital are coded. So if you don't have a code, it, it makes more administrative burden on the hospital to put in manually what to do. So therefore some, some companies ask for a PLC, PLC code to so have something uh, to, to hang it up on, so to say. Why should it then not apply for, for let's put this one, uh, for, for a code? You could, uh, for instance, apply for a new technology APC code for so pay for certain new services. Typically get the answer within six months for, from uh, CMS, which handled this. Uh, the problem here is that, uh, first of all, you need to meet the criteria. It must be new force within Medicare, uh, no pass-through payment on the device, meaning that it, it's not a part of another procedure. Th then, of course, after you get the initial code, depending on what kind of data you have, then, then it can be very low. If you're unlucky, it's very low payment and, and it's very difficult to change the mind if you have sent in something to the authority for, for look into. So, so sometimes lots of companies realize that if you send it in now and, and we expect to get thousand dollars and we get hundred dollars, it it's not that good because it's you need to put in so much evidence and you, and you have to live with that code typical two to three years. And if you have a device in the marketplace uh, where you don't really get paid for, for like three years, it's a huge risk that your device is dead in the marketplace later on. So that's the reason why lots of companies are not really applying for the new technology APC, unless you have lots of good data when you do it, uh, because there are also risk in it. Uh, they do this, uh, I mean, it take, basically takes six months and, and the next quarter then they decide for this. So, so it's it's a quite risky business to do that uh, and it's quite simple to apply for it and put in the data but, but it's as I said it's a risky but it's, it's also one way to do it. Uh, the code experts they claim money according to the codes they do not provide actual medical services uh, which means that they go through the processes procedures in, in the hospitals ensure that they do this and right. But as I said, if you don't have a code and your device clearly can save money, you might not need a code. That, that might be that you don't need it, to be honest, more than the, you put in a PLC code, some basically are free to get just for them to put into the system. This is the following. 
because then the good thing you want to have a code into the system because clearly if you have the statistic on, on, on what, how your product is used, you can be able to use that for, for other purposes. Because if you have the codes in the system where they actually put certain amount of dollars, could be zero dollars for, for that code, then you can see how many are using your product in, in a certain way. And that itself can, can be a good thing for, for the future. Uh, of course, if the cost of the device is high and not enough value, the code can be negative. If, if the code is less than the cost of goods, for instance, which quite often happen, then you will not be able to sell it. Then it's up to the doctor to say, we want to have this because we, we think we can increase the, the patient outcome on this one. Are you allowed not out there? Now there are lots of consultants which can help you, very expensive. Sometimes I, I try to, I mean, would, would think about convert to a more uh, reimbursement consultant because they probably have like 10 times my hour rate. Uh, but there are lots of, of uh, consultants out there which are charging lots of money. And, and typical what you have to watch out for is that many of them always try to opt for, for a new code because that's where they own most of the money, but that's also where most of your risks are. And, and I normally, in the past life, I've been uh, meeting lots of these consultants and, and uh, typical when I was, was heading up the life science uh, rare affairs uh, uh, part of, of General Electric, my budget uh, for, for just eating dinners with these kind of people was, was uh, very high, I would say. Lots of thousands of dollars, even though a few meetings. So, so they are very expensive and they are very expensive to drive. Because one's quite often a need to also have uh, uh, tried to affect people in Washington to do certain type of decisions. Another good thing is to try to use uh, medical societies or, or uh, other advocators for the clinical value, doctors, etc., because they are more, more trustworthy than you as a company. Costs and how long will it take? That's a very difficult question. If codes exist, it's just quite simple. Make sure the market clearance from FDA, if, if you need that in the case for use, support the code, you're done. Uh, need a new code can take a long time and the cost of fortune depends on evidence you have and what evidence is needed. But have to be careful with new codes, as I said. If the code will be too low, your product might be dead in the market. Revised code sometimes can be difficult. Some, some people think we start with a, the with a code and then we can revise it. Remember that it's the typical needs two to three years before they actually will revise the code because you need to have lots of data from real life. So, so that's very costly and, and there are, the outcome can be difficult to handle. Uh, there are lots of things you can read about the different systems. Uh, one of the goods page is the, the governmental CMS.gov page. There you can read around about how the Medicare and, and the different coding works. Uh, if you would like to look into the new technology APS where to get a, a quick code, but with some risk, then you can go into this link because there clear, clearly states what you need to do to be, to be able to submit for, for a temporary code. Some companies which are not really into the US market, which doesn't have that much to lose, can think about that because clearly if, if, uh, if it's not a prioritized market, you, you don't really have that much to lose uh, if you don't really want to get in there. But, it, but it's, you have to think through that carefully. So I think almost man managed to do it in time. Uh, questions? Problem many, but, but it's... Uh, uh, yeah, if you have a specific question, I hope to be able to answer. Yeah, thank you, Peter, so much. That was interesting and quite complicated. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy I don't have to go through uh, any process uh, when it comes to coding. And, and I think it's from a coding perspective, it is, I mean, you typically don't need to do that. What you need to do uh -huh. is to ensure that your product yeah. actually uh, meet a certain code and what you need to do. And, and uh, of course, all, most standard products all of them have a code. Yeah. So, so it's more if you have a new product which do not have a code, uh, then, then you have to look into it more carefully. 
but it's also it's important to try to see if you, if you develop a new product, even though you have products in the marketplace, what is what is the benefit of the new product? What should perhaps be changed in the, in the case for use before you actually go to the market? Because if you do that beforehand, you might be able to actually uh, tick kick an old product, kick the live of the old product again because you, you have changed something and can claim another reimbursement code. And, and the whole idea with the reimbursement coding system is that the older the products service is getting, the less payment you get. Uh, and it's more like it's not that you get less payment, but it's actually not uh, recalculated. Uh, the yearly recalculation, they are not increasing it. So it slowly dies, basically, unless you have new evidence. And also just to add, which are not the US reimbursement, but, but uh, each market have their own way of viewing this, what is actually clinical value. Good example is comparing uh, Sweden with Germany uh, and outpatient versus inpatient. Uh, and if, if your base Basic claim is, is that it can be an outpatient instead or inpatient. And that works fine in Sweden, but in Germany, where they have 10 times hospital beds, which means that they already have the infrastructure. So the, the business case might be different. And, and that, that's quite often that happens that you think that this works very fine in Sweden, but this yeah. hospital system is different and work different in different countries. And that's the key to realize what, what is the key thing in this particular market. And could that be the case in the US also, where probably the providers earn more money by having inpatients than outpatients? No, actually, what what I've tried to do in most systems is to, to get outpatients more paid. Okay. Because they know right. that they there do. are more there are okay. more procedures internally, so so they try to get uh, procedures where you, you don't need to stay overnight to yeah. get higher rates because they know that the total rate will be higher. In, in the radiotherapy as an antidote, it is more like uh, there are lots of single device uh, centers in US because there are lots of high paid and the, you, you want to be close to the shopping malls. So mm -hmm. you can go and make a radiation treatment and then go, go and shop. So, so there are these kind of things uh, in all kinds of, of, of modalities. And, and it, it's uh, there also more, more like smaller units but they earn lots of money, so, so it's it's uh, the complete healthcare market is, is driven by, by lots of behaviors of, of, of people. So, so, so it's more difficult to understand that. And it's also, I had lots of staff in US and I remember one time that one of my persons in, in which I was a manager over got cancer. And it turns out that the, that the, the health plan the company had for, for the employees only covered half of the treatment. Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, it was radiation therapy. And, and it was, uh, of course, the plan was 30 fractions, 30 times going to hospital. The insurance only, only paid 15. 15. Yeah. So, so the rest had to be paid by the, by the person himself. Yeah. That was some $150,000 to be paid personally. So, so, so that's a completely different system to have different health plan yeah. and each health plan might have different codes to have different procedures and they pay differently. So, so, so that's why the diff, all these 900 different providers have different rules for this. Mm. So, so if you go, for instance, if you have bigger insurance companies and, and get the, to talk with them, it might be possible that your product fits very well in one insurance company's uh, provider scheme because they, they earn money. So, so typically the bigger ones have their own coding system in addition to Medicare. Mm -hmm. where you can get your product a code into that system, but not for the Medicare, for instance. So, so there are lots of different routes, uh, which make it even more difficult. Phew. <laughs> so anyone else that has a question now, or are you? <laughs> I'm sure you, you don't have the full picture. <laughs> of course, I have my contact details if there's something you specifically want to discuss and, and it's uh, you can always contact me later on. And, and I guess you will sending out the, uh, the, the presentation to all the participants later on. So. Yeah, and we will also uh, have the, the recording if, uh, if you're interested. Um, 
But if there really are no questions for Peter, I would just uh, like to, well, first add that uh, please check out the, the invitation um, for the delegation trip. And in case you're not on the usual Swicker list of recipients, please let me know, send me an email. Um, so I can send you the invitation individually. Uh, and uh, apart from that, I'd just like to say thank you so much for for this, Peter. Uh, I think we are enlightened at a higher level, but or confused at a higher level. Yeah, more confused for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's been yeah really great to hear all your insights from all your years of experience in this area. Good. Right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Ja, stort tack.